Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Weary Weekly History and Entertainment News. As summer is near its end and fall is beginning, schools are starting up and events will be changing. On this episode, I'll be talking about when local schools are opening, plus a short discussion on Labor Day events, and Mass Mocha Open Studios. In addition, I'll be giving a review of the first Disney Plus Marvel series, WandaVision, which I was finally able to see two years after its original release. First, it's time for this episode's trivia question. This episode's question is, how much money have all the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies combined for at the United States box office? According to BoxOfficeMojo.com. Now, for this episode's local headlines. As stated at the beginning of this episode, school is back in session in Berkshire County. As such, it's important to know when school is starting throughout the many districts, so you can prepare for the year of learning ahead and adjust your driving schedule. Here is the list of when school systems in Berkshire County are reopening. First, Lee Public School District starts with a half day on August 28th before opening for everyone on August 29th. Central Berkshire Public Schools opens for all students on September 4th. North Adams and Mount Greylock begin for August 31st for all grades, K kindergarten through 8, and September 1st for 9 through 12 for all students. For Pittsfield Public Schools, their first day of school is August 31st for all students. Grades 1 through 5 6 and 9 will arrive in the morning, grades 6 and 9 for new student orientation, and grades 7 through 8 and 10 through 12 will arrive in the afternoon. The first day of kindergarten will be on September 7th. Local colleges are also starting up. In Pittsfield, Berkshire Community College will be hosting a new student orientation on August 31st with classes beginning on Tuesday, September 5th. In MCLA at North Adams, they will be very busy from September 2nd through September 5th with kickoff week. Please note that these days will be a little crazier for traffic with students moving into dorms. So it's important to avoid places near MCLA unless transportation is necessary. Classes start on September 6th. The same goes for Williams College on August 31st through September 6th, as they have their first days for new and returning students. Again, traffic near the college should be avoided unless it is necessary. Classes start on September 7th. Stay tuned later in this episode for a history of Williams College. Labor Day is almost here. This is the first true holiday of the fall and marks the end of the long, hot summer. Some Berkshire County places will be holding events though not related to the Labor Day holiday itself. The first is 
Chesterwood in Stockbridge. They will be holding a tour of Daniel Chester French's estate. As I've mentioned before on WWHEN, French was the architect for the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. This tour takes a deeper look at Daniel Chester French and his early training in Italy, including his gentlemanly pursuits of romance, his training under Thomas Ball, and his artworks produced in Florence, Italy. How did Italian, classical, Renaissance, and even Baroque art continue to infiltrate his structural style? Not only will Chesterwood discuss his Florentine works, but they will look at the design of Chesterwood itself as an Italian transplant into the heart of the Berkshires. This will be open from 3 to 4 p.m. Also happening is a car show at Great Barrington. There will be 40 show favorites, a best of show car, best of show truck, engine, paint awards, plus food and games for the kids. This will be happening from 5 to 8 p.m. Finally, there will be a Moby Dick Readathon at Berkshire County Historical Society in Pittsfield. Anyone who goes to this, which will be held all day, will be allowed to read part of Moby Dick at this place. This is of any interest for readers of literature. Visit berkshirehistory.org to register. Our next story takes us to the Berkshire Anthenaeum in Pittsfield. Earlier in 2023, I discussed how they were writing, holding short story writing contests for kids and young adults. After a summer of writing, the winners have been announced. For each category, there was an honorable mention, second place, and first place. First, ages six to eight. In this category, the honorable mention was The Two Magic Scarves by Chloe Misk. Second place went to The Three Enemies by Lacey Beats. And first place went to The Gingerbread Lady by Kaylee Gallagher. For ages 9 to 10, honorable mention was the Segrubu Family Trip Number 1, The Cottage by Missy Burgess. Second place was Flying Socks by Sophie Goddard. And first place went to Trapped at Tanglewood by Tyler Banfield. For ages 11 to 13, honorable mention was The Truth About Writing by Jocelyn Coco Gillerardi. Second place was Fairyland by Nora Sacconi. And first place was Surviving the American Dream, a historical fiction short story by Olivia Monti. Finally, in the age 14 to 17 category, honorable mention went to Jumping Out by Jack Niner. Second place went to Life to Death by John McComish. And first place went to Home by Amelia Coco Girardi. WWHEN congratulates all the winners on their success and hopes they keep writing in the future. We stay in Pittsfield for our next story as Berkshire Theatre Group will be hosting a production of Copenhagen. Winner of the 2000 Tony Award for Best Play, Copenhagen is a gripping and intellectually stimulating play that explores the events surrounding a mysterious and fateful meeting between two 
of the most brilliant minds of the 20th century. Niles Bohr and Werner Heisenberg. Niles Bohr is joined by his wife Margaret as they engage in a heated and thought-provoking conversation with Heisenberg. As the conversation unfolds, the characters grapple with their past and present roles in the development of atomic weapons and the potential consequences of their work. Set in Nazi-occupied Denmark during World War II, the play is a fascinating exploration of the ethics of science and the consequences of our actions. Throughout the play, audiences are taking on a thought-provoking journey through the minds of these two Nobel laureate physicists who were at the forefront of the development of the atomic bomb. If you saw the movie Oppenheimer in theaters earlier this summer, this play is of interest. Copenhagen will be running from September 8th until October 29th. Visit BerkshireTheaterGroup.org to purchase your tickets. Our next stop is at the Stationery Factory in Dalton. They will be holding two concerts over the next few weeks. The first is the 20th anniversary of DJ BFG. I've mentioned him quite a few times here on WWHGN. He performs at the Stationery Factory regularly. And he also performed at one of the third Thursdays at Pitchfield this past summer. There will be food, drinks, and music at this party. This will be going on September 1st from 8 to 11 p.m. Please note that this event is for ages 18 and over, so please have some form of an ID with you. The other concert of interest is Best Friends Girl. Best Friends Girl recreates the timeless hits of the Cars spanning a 35-year career with over 23 million albums sold and having more than 22 songs on the Billboard Top 100. The Cars undoubtedly left their mark in pop culture with notable hits like Best Friends Girl, Shake It Up, Magic, Let's Go, and Moving in Stereo, which gained fame from its placement in the movie Fast Times at Ridgemont High. As for the band itself, Best Friends Girl are comprised of lifelong, top-notch, professional musicians whose goal is to keep the music of the cars alive with every performance. This concert will be going on September 8th at 7.30 p.m. Visit the website shown here to purchase tickets for all events. Our next story takes us to Mass Mocha in North Adams, where they will be hosting open studio sessions. Here, you can visit the museum and then come over to buildings 13 and 34 for drinks, snacks, and great conversation. The artist in residence have been working on these pieces for months and love discussing to the public their work. There are many different artists in residence for the month of September. In fact, there are way too many to discuss in one WWHEN episode alone. Visit the website shown here for more information. The Artist in Residence program is running from now until September 14th. This is free for all guests. Visit MassMocha.org for tickets and more information. Our next event takes us to Lenox for their Jazz Stroll. This highlights jazz in Berkshire County. George Suler's documentary film, The Modern Jazz Quartet from Residency to Legacy, kicks off for the third year in a row as the Ted Rosendahl Trio kicks off the music 
with a concert on Friday evening at Gateways Inn featuring Mary Ann McSweeney on bass and Connor Meehan on drums. Saturday features nine acts performing throughout the day and includes sets by Mukana, Dominique Eid, Susie Stern, and more. This is a production of Milltown Foundation and with support from generous partners Lennox Chamber of Commerce, Lennox Cultural District, Synaids, Berkshire Fairfield, Blue Q, and Berkshire Jazz. And all of the events for this are free and open to the public. The stroll will be going on from September 14th through the 16th. Visit the website shown here for more information. It's now time for this episode's history portion of WWHEN. We talked about Williams College earlier in the episode. So now we'll be traveling to Williams College. This is one of America's most well-respected liberal arts schools. Williams College has ranked first in every U.S. News and Reports, World Reports rankings of National Liberal Arts Colleges every year since 2004. And alumni have earned nine Pulitzer Prizes, 71 have become members of the United States Congress, and former President James A. Garfield graduated there, just to name a few. Williams College's history started off in humble roots. As discussed on previous episodes of WWATN, it and Williamstown are named after Colonel Ephraim Williams, Jr. Williams was a soldier and landowner who was killed in the French-Indian War in 1755. No known photographs of Mr. Williams exist, probably due to a lack of photography in 1755. Instead, here is a drawing of what he may have looked like. In his will, he gave a significant sum to the town of Williams on two conditions. One, that the town would be named after him, and two, that a free school would be established in his honor. Both of his conditions were met, but the free school did not last long. It was eventually transformed into Williams College. By 1850, the school was struggling. There were only two buildings and 58 students. In fact, the Board of Trustees voted to move part of the college to Amherst, Massachusetts under a new name, Amherst College. This created an academic and athletic rivalry between the two schools that remains in place today. Former Williams President Edward Dorr Griffin is considered by many to be the savior of the college. He helped install several new majors and created the academic dress which is worn by students at graduations throughout the United States today. In order to create equalities between the rich students and the poor students. As Williams' reputation grew, many changes were made to the educational system. Fraternities, long considered a burden to the college, were phased out beginning in 1962. And co-education, a college with both men and women, started in 1970, both with students and with leadership roles. It wasn't until 2018, however, that a female became Williams president. In July of that year, Maud Mandel began her tenure as the 18th president in the school's history, a position that she maintains today as of this episode.
Williams sports teams are known as the Eves, and they are named after the previously mentioned Ephraim Williams. Their mascot is a purple cow, a reference to Williamstown's farming history. Varsity sports began in 1859 when Williams lost to their rival Amherst in the first ever college baseball game. It is one of the 39 colleges that founded the NCAA, the driving force for American co college athletics. In 1961, Williams College banned its schools from participating in athletic championships after unruly celebrations following a basketball playoff win. When it formed the New England Ath Small College Athletic Conference, or NESCAC, in 1971, the other 10 colleges followed Williams' ban. It was lifted prior to the 1993-1994 season in all sports except football. With the postseason ban no longer in place, Williams has earned 37 national championships in multiple sports. Most recently in women's soccer and women's indoor track and field. And has been awarded the Director's Cup for overall Division III athletic excellence 21 times. It only trails Division I Stanford for most overall Director's Cup wins. Coincidentally or not, both schools are known for balancing academics and athletics. However, Williams may have it harder. As a Division III school, Williams offers no athletic scholarships. It's now time for this episode's movie, or in this case, TV portion of WWHEN. As the writers and actors strike continue to bring a halt to production in Hollywood, it's becoming clear that many popular scripted television shows will not be coming back in September. So, over the next few episodes, I'll be discussing some shows that I've been watching that are of interest. The first show I'll be discussing is the Disney Plus show WandaVision, which was the first Marvel Cinematic Universe TV show. Before reviewing the show, I'd like to give a discussion about streaming shows. A few times on WWATN, I've talked about how I am an anti-streamer. I don't believe in shows on streaming services because they generally don't share it with the public. Disney Plus is extremely notorious in this aspect. If there are ways around it, however, I will review movies or shows that stream because now I am on an even playing field. I was able to watch WandaVision by renting it through the CW Mars program that runs through the Berkshire Anthenaeum. In fact, there was only one copy of WandaVision in Western Massachusetts, which was located in Milford in Worcester County. Thank you, Milford. As for WandaVision itself, I can't go into the details of this show for two reasons. One, it is very hard to discuss anything that happens without spoiling the series. And two, the plot is a little complicated and has many things going on at once. With all that said, I can see why WandaVision became a cultural phenomenon. It's got all the things I love about Marvel, its action scenes, humor, and great special effects. 
WandaVision is on a range of genres. Action, sci-fi, drama, comedy, horror. If there is a genre, WandaVision includes it. If you recall on previous episodes, I've been complaining about Marvel's continuity lockout, where it's hard to know the latest Marvel movies without seeing the earlier ones. WandaVision closes some of the continuity lockout and will make it easier for further references. You still need to pay attention in the dialogue, however, because they reference so much previous Marvel movies. You can get this series on Disney+, Plus, but as I said before, it's also available on the CW Mars' website for rental. Since there is only one copy, though, patience is required. Marvel also brings us the answer to this episode's trivia question. As a reminder, this episode's question was, how much money have all the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies combined for at the United States box office? According to BoxOfficeMojo.com, the answer is $11.7 billion. Yes, billion. Some other interesting figures? The average Marvel movie earns just over $325 million. And all of them have earned over $130 million total. The highest grossing Marvel Cinematic Universe movie was Avengers Endgame, earning $838 million. It currently sits at number two of the highest grossing movies of all time, only trailing Avatar. Bringing up the rear, now not counting Marvel's four re-releases, is 2008's Incredible Hulk. It only earned $134 million. Actually, most movies would have loved to have made that much money. That ends this episode of Weary Weekly History and Entertainment News. If you would like to watch this or any other WWATN episode again, you can visit Pitchfield TVs and CTSB TVs websites shown here, or visit NBCTC's Facebook page. Also, if you would like to see the episodes in HD quality, make sure to check out my YouTube page at RT Weary. Thank you.